All right, so we're gonna be talking about osseous tissue. So let's go through osseous tissue here. All right, chapter five, skeletal system and osseous tissue. So osseous refers to bone, and you're gonna see that word come up several times as we go through um, the skeletal system. And just a quick introduction here, the skeletal system consists of skeletal bones, that makes sense, major component, the cartilage that is associated with bones. So um, a big one is articular cartilage. And this is the cartilage that is attached to the bones where they connect to one another, articulate with one another. So on the ends of here, see where the tibia and the femur meet, there's gonna be articular cartilage. Um, there's always articular cartilage you know, where these two bones meet. So on the humerus, with the glenoid fossa, the scapula, everywhere, everywhere there's two bones, meaning there's articular cartilage. And then ligaments. Now, ligaments connect bone to bone. And that is opposed to tendons. That connects bone to muscle. So the difference between a ligament and a tendon is tendons connect bone to bone. Super important to remember that. All right, so the major um, tissue, osseous tissue, and osseous again refers to bone. Um, and, um, you know, bones are the major component of the skeletal system. And really important to understand that bones are dynamic. And, and the definition of dynamic means it is changing it doesn't stay the same so it does not stay same oops that's a really horrible n so it changes over time and so bones change over time um, bones will change depending on exercise how much and the type of exercise weight bearing exercise if you are pounding your skeletal system into the ground you're running all the time, that stress of your skeletal bones being pushed down with the weight of your body in addition to gravity, um, which is a force acting on the weight of your body, those bones are going to have to respond by being stronger in order to counteract the force of gravity. And so weight-bearing exercise does stimulate the bones to become stronger and more dense. Hormones, hormones play a huge role. Hormones change throughout the lifetime, and so um, hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, um, they tend to promote um, bone growth activity, and as those hormones decline with age, so does the activity of, of your osteoblasts, and we'll talk about those, um, and so your bones become less dense due to hormones. Um, diet, two-thirds of your bones uh, material, you need to get through diet so your body does not create it and you have to eat specific things to help with that. Also different medications can interfere uh, with the absorption of um, minerals needed for bone density and, um, and also things like if you go into outer space. For astronauts, it's a really big deal. Um, there's something called Wolf's Law you know, like Wolf, I think it's Wolf, with like two Fs or something. Uh, Wolf's Law states that your body, your physiology is going to respond to the forces that are put upon it, right? So if you lift heavy weights, you're asking your muscles to move a bunch of weight. You're asking your muscles to produce a bunch of force, move a bunch of weight over and over again. Your body's going to respond by building more contractile proteins to slide past one another to produce more tension to move more weight. And um, in terms of bones, <clears throat> your body is going to adapt to the amount of force that you put upon your skeletal system. So swimming, swimming's great. Swimming, though, does not have a huge amount of um, gravity pounding on your body. So again, it's not going to increase bone density like weight-bearing exercise would just due to the forces are greater the actual forces pounding on your skeleton are greater when you're doing weight-bearing exercise um, bones work with muscles via tendons right 
to produce movement. So that's how we move around. All right, functions. So um, support, right? It's your skeletal framework. And this supports uh, all kinds of things from our brain down to, you know, our, our movements. Um, storage, uh, bone store minerals. And 98% of the calcium is stored in the bones. And you're like, okay, well, don't we have calcium to make our bones strong? Well, yes, because 98% of the body's calcium is stored in the bones. And um, calcium is a huge component of uh, bone tissue. But um, physiologically speaking, we use calcium for uh, muscle contraction. I'm just naming a few important things that we use calcium for. Uh, release of neurotransmitters for our nervous system to have other neurons um, fire off an action potential or have a muscle contract or um, release a hormone. Uh, we also use calcium for hormonal release. We use calcium for signaling um, molecules for cells to um, make something happen inside the cell. So these are super important things that we have to have happen all the time. And so with 98% of our calcium stored in the bones, if your blood calcium levels are low because of diet or a medication is interfering with the absorption of calcium, you need to keep your blood calcium levels at a certain um, concentration. And if they drop down, right, and the concentration drops down, then that's going to trigger the release of calcium out of your bones because your heart has to keep contracting, right? Um, your heart can't stop beating, the organism dies. If you pull calcium out of your bones and you get a little osteoporotic and your bones are less dense, you're not gonna die. So um, the higher functioning um, processes, physiological processes of calcium uh, are going to be taken care of first, bone density, last right so uh, other than that um, in your bone marrows in your red bone marrow you produce blood cells this is hemopoiesis you're producing red blood cells white blood cells and platelets for clotting um, in the yellow marrow some of your bones have yellow marrow and that just stores adipocytes or energy stores fat stores Protection, that should be obvious, right? You have a rib cage. It's protecting your vital organs, your uh, lungs and your heart. It protects vessels, it protects your brain, it protects your spinal cord, so protection. And then movement, right? We need our bones to actually produce movement. So uh, it acts as levers for the muscles to pull on and change the angle so you can move your body. Okay, just a quick overview. There are two coverings or linings that we need to talk about, and the outer lining is called the periosteum. Now remember when we talked about prefixes and suffixes, peri means around, and osteum refers to bone, so it's around the bone, versus endosteum, endo meaning inside, and osseum referring to bone, so inside the bone. And here, the endosseal lining is gonna be this inner marrow cavity lining, and the periosteum is going to be this outer lining, right? So it's lining the outside of the bone everywhere except where there's articular cartilage, where the two bones articulate or come together in that articular cartilage is gonna be found here where it attaches. So this is a humerus. Um, the scapula would be here. And here would be where the radius and ulnar bone are. Uh, and so this would be articular cartilage as well. So those are articular cartilage. Um, the periosteum serves as an attachment site and a route for vessels to come in. So right here, it's showing you that these are vessels and nerves. Nerves coming in here and here. And here. So um, the periosteum, these vessels and nerves go through the periosteum, as well as um, 
attachment sites for tendons. So um, if this is your humerus, you're gonna have your deltoid tuberosity right here. So the deltoid muscle is gonna attach laterally. And so this tendon is pulling on the humerus to get your arm to swing out to the side or away from your body. We call that abduction. And so this attachment site, so it attaches bone to deep fascia, it attaches bone um, to muscle, right? So um, these collagen fibers incorporate the periosteum and the tendons. This becomes the seam of where a tendon attaches to the periosteum of the bone. And uh, the weakest point of any structure is always going to be at the seam. It's not in the middle, um, it's where two things come together. So if you think about pants, nobody splits their pants, well, some people do, but the most common area where a pant will split open is where the two pieces of fabric are sewn together or the seam. Um, that is the weakest point, not in the middle of the fabric. Uh, and so the seam where the tendon attaches to the periosteum is always the weakest point. And so when someone strains a muscle or has a partial tear, a lot of time it's at the attachment site. And on MRIs, you can see what are called these Sharpie fibers. This is where the collagen fibers of the tendon that are interwoven with the periosteum kind of pull away from the periosteum and you can see them on an MRI. Um, the other thing I didn't um, mention but we're going to get to is that the periosteum and endosteum actively participate in grown both and repair, bone growth and repair. They have um, what are called osteoprogenitor cells. These are bone stem cells. And we'll talk about that in another slide. Um, the endosseum lining um, lines the marrow cavities, and so that's on the inside. So the histological organization of mature bone, uh, it's two-thirds inorganic and one-third organic. And that doesn't mean pesticide-free. It means that the definition of organic um, means it contains carbon, the element carbon. So if you study organic chemistry, you're studying chemistry um, that involves only carbon molecules as opposed to regular general chemistry. Inorganic refers to anything that doesn't contain carbon. So uh, two thirds of your bone is inorganic and it's gonna be calcium, phosphate, magnesium, it's gonna be ions. And these are inorganic, they don't contain calcium or carbon. And so this inorganic component, this two thirds um, inorganic component, you have to get through diet. So two thirds of your bone, you get through um, the food that you eat. Now these hypoxy appetite crystals, these crystals that are predominantly calcium phosphate crystals, are very resilient to compression, meaning if you're pushing down, say this is gravity, and I didn't even spell gravity right. You guys notice I'm a terrible speller. So that's gravity pushing down on your bones, right? And so gravity is a force that comes down vertically on top of something and compresses it down. These epoxy appetite crystals are great for compression they just push right back up and um, are able to withstand compressional forces of pounding straight down. They're not great though, if you were to hit it from the side. So a blow to the side of a long bone is going to potentially shatter these hypoxy appetite crystals. They're not great with bending or twisting. They're crystals, they, um, they don't, they don't withstand forces from different directions other than straight up and down the way they're set up. So sudden impacts, not great. Two thirds though, are these organic um, fibers, right? And so these organic collagen fibers are 
are very resistant to stretch and twisting, right? And um, strains from different sides. So if you have a blow to the side of your bone, you're not necessarily gonna shatter it because still one third of the bone matrix is an organic kind of more flexible component. So uh, the majority of the bone is great for compressional forces. There is some um, collagen fibers that are the organic component that help with some flexibility so you do, your bones don't just shatter every time they're touched from the side. Uh, the remainder of um, what it makes up our bone tissue are osteocytes. So um, osteo again is bone and site refers to cell. So bone cells, and they make up about two to 3%. And when it says, think of a straw, if you have a straw and you can push straight down on the straw and the straw just kind of stays straight up and down, you're pushing right down on the top of the straw. But if you were to push down on the straw, like gravity, um, and then have a force push on the side of a straw, then the straw is going to buckle. It's not gonna break because there's still this organic component, but it's going to bend. And that's um, kind of the analogy for your bones. So bone cells, um, there are four different kinds and I kind of have a little story that have to do with bone cells. And so let's start with the mama bone cells. So osteoprogenator cells, these are the stem cells for bones and they produce osteoblasts. So I like to call these the mama cells because they produce baby cells, which are osteoblasts. So osteoprogenator cells, they produce progeny. Right, so progeny um, refers to, um, well, if you say prodigal son, a lot of times you're talking about um, the offspring. So um, progeny, um, so I'm looking at a descendant. A progeny is a descendant or descendant of an offspring. And so um, osteoprogenator is, still, is saying bone, um, the cell that generates progeny or offspring, right? So that's where they get the, that's why I call them the mama cells. And they're producing baby cells that are osteoblasts. So osteoblasts are baby cells. They're immature bone cells. And these baby cells are what secrete the organic collagen fibers. And so osteoprogenator cells are here and they're creating new baby osteoblasts and the osteoblasts are starting to secrete material around it. And eventually when enough um, organic collagen fibers get secreted and it gets filled in between the spaces with the hypoxy appetite crystals like this, we now start to refer to this as an osteocyte. So an osteocyte is a mature bone cell. It has bone matrix completely surrounding it and uh, it maintains the integrity of the bone. So that's an osteocyte. Now, again, 98% of our calcium is stored in our bones. Um, storage in bones. So what do you do when you need some of that calcium, right? So you need blood calcium. Who are you going to call? You're going to call the osteoclasts. Osteoclasts uh, reside on the linings, the endosseal lining. And um, these osteoclasts are multinucleated because they're creating enzymes. And in each nucleus, there's DNA that's transcribing enzyme proteins. And these enzyme proteins are secreted as acids and, and, and enzymes. And their job in secreting these acids and enzymes is to break down bone matrix to release calcium. 
into the blood. So osteoclasts are what uh, liberate the calcium when you need calcium to be released from the bones. So here's kind of a little cheat sheet I have here of um, the cells of bones. So you have osteoblasts and um, osteoblasts are involved in the process of making new bone, which is called osteogenesis. Again, osteo is bone. Let's do this. Osteo is bone and genesis. Where have you heard the word genesis? Well, most, most people have heard the book of Genesis and that is the book of creation, right? So Genesis is referring to creation. And so osteogenesis basically means bone creation. So read through, through these, it kind of goes over what I've just gone over and talks about osteocytes, right? And so osteocytes maintain and monitor bone tissue. Um, they sit in these depressions called lacunae. And um, the lacunae are attached to one another via these little canals called caniculi. And so you're kind of seeing the caniculi here and the lacunae here. And um, so these little channels um, from the osteocytes to the bone capillaries so they can get nutrients and, and so forth. Osteoprogenitor cells or mesenchymal cells or stem cells that divide and differentiate to form new osteoblasts. These are the, the mitotic cells. And these are super important if you fracture or damage bone. Um, these are the cells that will start to the process of forming new bone again to mend that bone. And so they're found in the inner and outer lining, the endosseum and the periosteum. So endosteum and periosteum, and they help form new bone after injury. Uh, osteoclasts, again, perform osteolysis. Now, osteolysis, osteo again refers to bone, and lysis means to split, or lice, break apart. And so when you take chemistry, um, or even bio or physiology, you're going to hear words like glycolysis or gluco, um, glycogenolysis or lipolysis. Um, all of these uh, all lysis terms are going to refer to breaking something down or splitting the molecules apart. So osteolysis is breaking down bone tissue or splitting it apart. Now, this really comes into play when we talk about bone density, right? Because osteoclast activity or the breakdown of bone tissue has to be balanced by new bone tissue being created, right? So you generally want um, osteoblast activity to be equal, I should say equal or greater than osteoclast activity, so you have strong bones, because that equals strong bones. If this right here is not maintained, then you're gonna have weak bones or you'll have over, over calcified bones, which can, uh, there are diseases that, that are very rare, but it does happen. So um, we always look at osteoblasts, you know, they have to have a higher activity level for your bones to actually be getting bigger and stronger. Um, and what drives this a lot is blood calcium levels. So um, if blood calcium levels drop, then you're gonna have osteoclast activity be greater than osteoblast. If uh, you have really high blood calcium levels, you don't, and you need to store that um, excess calcium, you'll, your osteoblast will be generated and you'll store the calcium. Or if um, hormones are present, um, kids that are growing have higher levels of uh, sex hormones, and those sex hormones will drive osteoblast activity. And so there's a lot of growth and development kids are getting taller, they have higher levels of hormones during puberty, and that's stimulating greater osteoblast activity. So the bones are gonna get bigger, stronger, longer. All right, so structure and function of bones, there's two types of osseous tissue, and this is strictly in the three-dimensional makeup of the bone. So same bone cells. 
same two thirds uh, inorganic component and one third organic. So the tissue makeup is the same, but the way that it's laid out or structured is different. So compact bone is structurally different from spongy bone. Um, same cells and same um, matrix, uh, but they're just arranged or laid out differently. So compact bone is dense bone and uh, it's completely solid. And this compact bone is always gonna form the walls of the bone, right? So this is gonna be compact from here to here and they form a nice strong structure, it's solid. Spongy bone has spaces, so it kind of looks like a sponge, right? And there are holes. And uh, so they call it trabecular, the pattern. Um, pattern is referred to as trabecular or trabecular. And um, the spongy bones have the same organic and inorganic component, but it's arranged in these like little, what they call struts and plates, and there are holes in between. And so it looks like a sponge. And so this is actually a much lighter um, bone density structure, and um, it lines the marrow cavities and the ends. You can see this is more spongy bone on the ends of the bones, and then it's more compact along the shaft here because it needs to be strong for compressional forces. So compact bone is dense and solid, and um, it, what makes it dense and solid is the way it's made up or laid out. And the basic unit of compact bone is called an osteon. And so osteons are these uh, circular arrangements. So here's a half an osteon, here's an entire osteon. And so what it is is that the, um, you have what is called a central canal. So a central canal goes up through here. And this is where your arteries and veins, right? So these are the vessels. The vessels, because again, bones need to be constantly regenerating and, and, and um, being able to repair during fracture. So there's a lot of blood supply. And um, the central canal has these vessels going straight up and down along the axis of the osteon. And then you have these um, osteocytes here. And then you have the inorganic matrix or component filled in around the osteocyte. So it's completely solid and it's arranged in a circular fashion around a central canal. And then you have what are called perforating canals connecting the central canals. So perforating canals are kind of what I like to say perpendicular to the central canals, right? So central canal would be this and perforating canal would be that. Um, osteons are completely solid and uh, lamellae, by the way, refers to layers. So when they're arranged um, in a circle like this, they're called osteons or concentric lamellae. When they are kind of arranged circular around the outside of the bone, it's circumventing the bone so it's called circumferential. And then anything in between spaces is referred to as interstitial. Inter interstitial means between spaces. So you've heard the term interstitial fluid. Um, that is the fluid that surrounds cells in a tissue bed. And in bone, since it's compact, the matrix surrounding the bone cells is referred to as interstitial lamellae. So there goes, this goes through the definitions of um, compact bone, and it's giving you figures on this. Now, this is compact bone. Then you get into where it starts out the spongy bones, and it's the same uh, osteocytes and the same uh, interstitial lamellae in here, in here that's showing you all of this. It's just arranged in these little like spiral setups. And then you have the bone laid out in all these different directions. And so this is said to 
spongy bone kind of sets up this cross bracing for structural engineering. So you have a lot of spongy bone on the ends. And this is what called your greater trochanter, this is your femur. And so this is, this is the outside of your hip right here. You can kind of feel the greater trochanter on the outside of your upper hip. And that is the area where we tend to get hit. We tend to have forces coming at our upper hip area uh, a lot of times. And so spongy bone not only lightens the load, oops, because you have a lot of air or space here, and so it makes it less weight because you have less bone material, but it also cross braces. So if a force comes from this direction or that direction or that direction, you have bone that can absorb the forces in all these different directions. And so it's better for um, areas where you have forces coming from all different directions. Uh, so again, this is showing you an osteon, scanning electron micrograph, and here's the central canal. And then here's another um, x-ray kind of micrograph. And here you have some terms. So perforating canals used to be referred to as Volkman's canals and central canals or Haverston um, canals. Uh, and then lamellae goes through, you know, the definitions. It's always good to go through definitions. Uh, lamellae, caniculi, interstitial, trabeculae, um, and understand what those mean. Spongy bone, uh, it has trabeculae, so compact bone, the main thing is osteon. Spongy bone, the main thing is trabeculae. It's just, it's the term describing the 3D arrangement of the matrix. Um, this kind of goes through the struts and plates. It's just, it's this cross bracing, right? These are struts and plates. Uh, and there's holes in the middle. And spongy bone is going to line marrow cavities and be on the ends of the bones. It forms this open framework, which makes it lighter. It also provides strength in all different directions while producing, reducing bone weight. So differences between compact and spongy, obviously compact is great for compressional forces um, when forces are applied straight down on a human, you know, gravitational type forces. Um, less great if the forces are coming from a perpendicular angle or a different angle. Um, it's very strong, um, but spongy bone makes the skeletal bones a little bit lighter, easier to move around, and also has extensive cross bracing with these trabeculae, and so it can deal with stresses from the sides or different stress lines. Um, again, they only differ in 3D arrangement, uh, but the histological organization matrix, so forth, is the same. So you're going to find compact bones where bones are heavily stressed gravitationally, and spongy bones going to be at the ends where bones tend to get hit from different angles. Uh, long bones, it, it is um, just defining the shape not how long it is. So like your digits are long bones. They're not very long, but they're shaped like long bones. And so all long bones are going to have epiphyses at the ends. The middle part that forms the shaft is called the diaphysis. And then this area here is called the metaphysis. That's where the diaphysis and the epiphysis join together. And um, and that's the area that is the last to get replaced with hyaline cartilage. So I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, this slide again, I, I do need you to know um, the endosseum, where it's located, um, what cells are found there, and when it's most active. 
um, as far as well as the um, osteoclasts, right? So osteoclasts are going to be active when you need more blood calcium. Um, now, <clears throat> I alluded to hyaline cartilage. So uh, bones start out predominantly hyaline cartilage. And the hyaline cartilage, that's why, you know, people joke babies bounce. They don't really bounce. They're just more cartilage than they are bone tissue. And so they are a little bit more bouncy, right? They, it's, cartilage tends to be more flexible than osseous tissue. And as they grow, they grow through a process. This process is forming new bone. It's osteogenesis. And the term ossification refers to the process of replacing other tissues like hyaline cartilage with bone tissue. So there's two ways your bones grow, intramembranous ossification and endochondrial ossification. So remember, um, endochondrial is referring to long bones, the way they grow. Um, intramembranous is the way flat bones or dermal bones tend to, to grow in size. Calcification, by the way, a lot of tissues can deposit calcium sites. That's calcification. Ossification is specific to replacing other tissues with calcium tissues or with calcium. So intramembranous ossification takes place in a membrane. It's intramembrane, so within the connective tissue membrane, and they're known as membrane bones or dermal bones. These tend to be the flat bones, like your skull or your mandible, um, clavicles, sternum. <clears throat> and so you have these mesenchymal stem cells that, that are osteoprogenator cells that are dividing, and um, the bone, um, the osteoblasts have this osteoid um, secretion around it, and then it gets packed in with um, calcium phosphate crystals, and this keeps happening, and the bones just kind of get bigger inside this membrane. Endochondrial ossification is um, how most of the bones are, and that's how they grow in length. And so remember, hyaline cartilage is getting uh, replaced with bone tissue or osseous tissue. And when all of the hyaline cartilage has been replaced, we say you're fully grown. So uh, the uh, growth plates that people talk about are just where there is still hyaline cartilage. And so on an x-ray, x-rays only pick up that two-thirds inorganic component. X-rays are bouncing off the hypoxy apatite crystals, the calcium phosphate crystals. Uh, so if there's cartilage there, the x-ray is not going to bounce off that cartilage. It's just going to go through. So what happens is where there's still cartilage, it just looks like blank spots. But this is hyaline cartilage, right? And so you still have cartilage here. And um, so it looks blank. As you age, you can see this hyaline cartilage has, has been replaced or osteogenesis has occurred. Um, uh, and so the bones are all next to one another. And so you can see all the bone matrix. So um, there are seven steps for endochondrial ossification. And um, so the chondrocytes get bigger, blood vessels kind of grow around the cartilage and into the shaft, and then spongy bone is produced in the what's called the primary ossification centers at the end and then uh, remodeling around this marrow cavity occurs, and then secondary ossification centers occur. And you have also what is referred to as appositional bone growth. So as these endochondrial um, centers, primary centers grow in length, the appositional growth is to grow in diameter. So the bone doesn't just get longer, but it also gets wider. Otherwise, you'd have this little toothpick bone and it would be not very wide to support um, the weight of a full-grown person. Um, in appositional bone growth, as new bone grows out, the marrow cavity here has to get bigger. And so you do have osteoclasts um, dissolving the bone matrix. Remember, bones are highly innervated and uh, vascular, and so uh, we're going to start getting into 
um, naming all the bone landmarks. And foramen means a hole through a bone. So anytime you see the word foramen, it's going to be referring to a hole through a bone. So nutrient foramen is referring to uh, where the arteries and veins go in, providing nutrients. Um, and so you'll see that going into the marrow cavity. Factors that regulate bone growth. Again, I touched on this in the beginning of the lecture. Uh, diet. Diet's huge, right? Because two-thirds of your bone matrix is from diet, right? So if you're not getting enough calcium or you're having to use calcium to buffer the acids that you take in, like citric acid from soda uh, or um, the acid from coffee, then um, your calcium is going to go to have to deal with the acidity of that, kind of buffer it or make it less acid, and so you're going to have less calcium. So diet's super important. You need these ions as well as vitamin D, vitamin A, and vitamin C in order to have this inorganic component form um, properly. Hormones um, are super important because they regulate osteoblast and osteoclast activity. And so, um, oops, I seriously did not spell that right. Let's try that again. Osteoblast is part of the problem with me trying to write. Uh, and so parathyroid hormone um, and the thyroid has hormones as well as the kidneys um, that all work on um, calcium levels in different ways. So parathyroid horm hormone acts to increase calcium absorption in the small intestines and decrease the excretion of calcium in your urine. So it's working on the digestive tract and the urinary tract. Right, so parathyroid hormone is trying to conserve calcium. It's trying to absorb more out of the food you eat and conserve it and not have it leave your body. Um, increased osteoclast activity is the direct result of parathyroid hormones. Um, calcitonin, which is from the thyroid, um, works the opposite. It works against parathyroid hormones, so um, decreases activity. And uh, growth hormone, which is produced by the pituitary gland, um, thyroxin, which is produced by your thyroid glands, um, they all increase osteoblast activity to lead in bone growth. That's why um, growth hormone injected um, like steroids, anabolical steroids are going to have, you're going to have different funny bone growth um, forehead. You see it in people's heads, their um, cranial bones um, look a little weird. Uh, sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen, they also increase bone growth or osteoblast activity. Exercise again, due to Wolf's Law, um, your bone is going to respond to the mechanical stress or pounding. And if you have a lot of pounding on your skeletal system, your, your body's going to get more dense bones to deal with the pounding that it has to endure. So exercise hormones, um, and diet. So hormones regulate osteoblast osteoclast activity. Uh, diet is for you know getting that two-thirds component in your body and then exercise is Wolf's Law. You, it, your body is going to respond to the additional forces. So maintaining bone density um, is really a, a lifetime um, thing that we have to think about, right? So uh, it's a normal bone here and the bone of someone that has osteoporosis, right? So porous bones and um, could be due to elderly decrease in hormones. Medication like prednisone can decrease the amount of absorption of calcium in the small intestines. Hormones, um, hypothyroidism um, can lead to uh, lower bone density. And so, um, age, hormone level, disease, um, 
poor diet can all result in osteoporosis as we age, right? So it's due to a lack of calcium, lack of exercise, hormonal imbalance, um, altered absorption of nutrients, decreased collagen production and hormone levels. So um, females after the age of 30 and accelerated about 40, 45, as estrogen decreases, um, you're gonna have that hormone lower. And so the osteoblast activity is gonna be lower and you start to lose bone density, right? Males, um, it starts to happen more towards 60. Testosterone starts to um, lower. So factors regulating bone growth, here's a list kind of of everything we just went over. Um, and so this is the first, and it goes into different hormones and how they act, right? So all the hormones we talked about, parathyroid hormones, thyroid hormones, calcitonin, um, thyroxine, growth hormone, estrogen, testosterone. Um, one other thing I wanted to, besides this that you could read, right, is that um, the more you do weight-bearing exercise, and that includes not just things like running, but weightlifting. Um, remember, tendons attach to bones. And um, tendons, right, are the ends of muscles. So end of muscle is a tendon. And so if you're using these muscles, to lift heavy weight. You're really pulling on the tendon with more, more force. And that tendon is really pulling on the bone with more force. And so that additional force is gonna cause the bone in the, in the tendon periosteal site to increase um, osteoblast production. And so you end up with a larger attachment site site because you're going to have larger muscle right so if you're lifting heavy weights over and over again your muscle is going to get bigger right and if the muscle gets bigger the attachment site of that muscle to the bone also has to get bigger right? So attachment site. And so you're building more bone to have a bigger attachment site. Uh, so you will see when we start talking about um, you know, tibial tuberosity or your deltoid tuberosity, these areas where tendons of specific muscles are attached, the stronger a person is and the more weights they are lifting, the more they're pulling on that attachment site. The bigger that attachment site will actually be on the bone. And so in real bones, um, you can see the attachment site of one person could be a lot larger than the attachment site of another person because one person lifted more weights and was more active than the other person. So again, we get back to that concept of dynamic, right? Bones are dynamic. And you can see it in the skeletons of people who, you know, have died and you look at their bones and they can one bone that's a femur could be the exact same length as another bone of someone else who femur. And the one of, that the person worked out a lot or did a lot of weight bearing exercise is gonna be heavier. It's gonna weigh more and the attachment sites are gonna be more pronounced. Um, so these are dynamic organs. Um, this goes through the different types of fractures and I'm sure in lab you will go through different compression fractures and spiral fractures and green stick fractures um, and you can read through those. Um, I don't test specifically on fractures because um, we have a lot of other stuff to cover um, but you can read through them. Uh, when a bone is broken um, and bleeding occurs uh, a network of spongy bone kind of forms and then osteoblasts are overly active and you tend to have what they refer to as like super bone in that area, which is really just a callus um, forming uh, because it, you over you overproduce in that area and in that area. So you kind of have a bump 
generally where you break a bone. It ends up repairing itself stronger and kind of thicker than normal. So that's that bump or callus. Anyone that's broken a bone kind of knows they can feel this external callus where the break used to be. All right, a few more things, housekeeping things. Um, and one of them is classification of bones. And this is just based on shape. So we classify bones based on shape. If they're kind of long slender bones, we call them long bones. If they're physically flat, like ribs or sternums or your cranial bones, we call them flat. Uh, sutural wormium bones, we don't really um, go over any of those specifically, but they are found between flat bones in the skull. Um, we do kind of go through irregular, which is vertebra, and um, like your ethmoid, your sphenoid bones of the skull. Uh, short bones are the tarsals and carpals. They're just kind of short and boxy. And then sesamoid bone, we have one that we talk about, and that's the patella. And that's your kneecap. Um, so this goes through classification of bones. Uh, the last thing I want you to start thinking about are bone markings. So uh, we're going to start to talk about all of these landmarks on the bones. So yes, this is a femur but you're not gonna to have to identify the femur, you're gonna to have to identify the lesser trochanter, greater trochanter, or the uh, gluteal tuberosity, or the medial condyle and lateral condyle. So we're gonna st start talking about these things and um, things come up over and over again. And so the slide didn't come up great, but I'll go through the process, trochanter, tuberosity, tubercle. These are all bumps or projections off the bone. A crest is kind of a ridge. So this right here is a crest, a ridge. A line is going to be like this, this arcuate line here. Spines, um, you're gonna see a spine on, um, well, these pointy things are spines. Uh, there's also a spine on the scapula. Condyles, condyles are rounded ends of bones that articulate with another bone. So these are condyles. These are condyles. They're the areas that articulate with another bone. So you really find them on femur, tibia, humerus. Um, those are the main condyles. Or your mandible, where your jaw has this condyle that, that projects out and attaches here to the temporal bone. Um, trochlea is kind of um, specific to the uh, condyle of the humerus. So that's a specific thing. Uh, for Raymond, uh, and canal, those are always gonna be a passageway or hole through a bone, right? So you're gonna end up seeing a lot of foramens. These are foramens, they're holes. This is where nerves and blood vessels can get from one side of the bone to the other side of the bone, right? So if your brain's in here, you have a lot of nerves and those nerves have to go through from inside the cranial cavity to outside so you can feel things out here on your face, right? So this is how um, foramens are how things get through, or blood vessels. Um, fossas are shallow depressions in bones. So always think of fossa like um, it's a fossil, right? And so um, fossils you have to dig, right? So you dig out a fossil. And so it's a shallow depression that was dug out. So um, this area here that's kind of scooped out is a fossa. And so you'll see these shallow depressions or scooped out or dug out area of a bones referred to as a fossa. So um, projections um, are often referred to as processes, same thing. Processes are projections off a bone or um, kind of something that sticks up off the bone. So they can be trochanters, crest spines, um, trochanters, tubercles, tuberosities, condyles, trochleas, um, which is a condyle. Um, but please read through these. Um, we'll go through sinus, that's just a hole or chamber. Um, that's filled with air in the bone, um, canals, fissures, foramens, process is any projection off a bone, ramus, an extension of a bone that forms an angle with the rest of the structure. So we'll talk about a few ramuses. Um, 
And then again, this goes and shows you cross the line spine, trochanter, um, and so forth. So go through these and just kind of familiarize yourself with these terms. Uh, because when we start on chapter six and seven, we'll be talking about a lot of those terms. Um, again, bones are not inert. They don't stay the same. They are dynamic and change. Um, and so depending on how you live, you work out endocrine system, which is your hormones, right? Hormones, uh, what you eat, um, all are going to affect the bone tissue or histological arrangements of your bone. And so that concludes chapter five.